three. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter six, verse 13 through 14 says, therefore put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground. Everyone say, stand your ground on the evil day of danger and having done all the crisis demands, stand firmly, everyone say firmly, in your place, stand therefore and hold your ground. So he tells us to stand three times. And so we've been talking about this and this isn't like when everything, uh, when you've done everything else, just keep standing. That's not what that means. That's what people say, which gives the implication that faith isn't now. Faith is now and you have it now. You don't have it when you see it. You have it when you believe it. And so is it that challenging to stand when you know you have it when you believe it? Or are you just walking by sight and pretty much carnal and need to get your head out? Hallelujah. Having brought, write it down, the battle to the ultimate conclusion, at the end of the fight, you will be standing. Who brought the, vibe, the, the fight to the ultimate conclusion? The Lord Jesus did. The Lord Jesus brought the battle to the ultimate conclusion. There's no do-over. It literally is finished. There's no rematch. The devil doesn't get a second chance. God has already done everything he's going to do about your victory, about your healing, about your prosperity. Colossians 2.15 says that the enemy's power has already been stripped. We're not waging war against an equal opponent. We are dealing with a defeated, prideful foe who only has deception, which means if you will be a person of truth, he will have no access to you. If you will be a person of truth, and guys, a big part of receiving the truth is is obviously understanding its source. You can't separate somebody's words from them. And 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. You know, your love walk is crucial to your success in your life of faith. It's so crucial. It is not worth it to be out of love ever with others, to be offended with yourself, to be offended with the world at large. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to have any sort of fear because 1 John 4, 18 says that perfected love drives out fear. It drives out fear. So we don't want any secret places where the enemies had access to basically make a nest because the truth will not prevail in a place of strife. It will not. The truth will not prevail in a place of strife. I want you to look at, before we jump into these things that we can learn from our pastors in our stand, well, hallelujah. Proverbs 23 Proverbs 23, and I'm going to read from the Passion Bible, and this is verse 17 and 18. Proverbs 23, 17 and 18. Okay. Proverbs 23, 17, don't allow the actions of evil men to cause you to burn with anger. Instead, everyone say instead. Instead. Burn with unrelenting passion as you worship God in holy awe. Your future is bright and filled with a living hope that will never fade away. Remember the circle of influence that we frequently talk about. If the president isn't calling you today, then stop concerning yourself about what he's doing. If the governor is not in in somebody that you are counseling today, let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Like, let her do whatever she's going to do. Your boss, whoever is outside of your direct world of influence is absolutely a distraction and a waste of your efforts. And in doing that, because you only have so much effort, you only have so much energy, you only have so much time, you've got enough to deal with just yourself, but then throw a couple kids in that mix, a spouse, relationships with accountability, friends, leadership response. You don't have time to waste your emotional energy on things that are not your responsibility. Okay, so, and, and here's the thing. If you even, if you're a leader here at Choose Life and you even put it on a wrap, I'm gonna call you on it. Yeah. I'm gonna call you on it. 
I read every single rap. So you can even tell the spirit in which somebody writes something that's basically blaming somebody else for whatever's not going, not going right. And again, other, everyone that comes in here today is a volunteer, except for the people that are paid, staff. So you, your stuff better absolutely not be stinking or let me not see you writing something on there that puts a, like a, a, they got a speck in their eye and you got a beam in your eye. That doesn't work. Right, right? now, that doesn't mean we don't communicate. But it does mean that there's a spirit about our life that recognizes that we're all growing, but my primary responsibility is to me and those that I have direct influence over. And I'm not looking to exploit what other people are or aren't doing or blame other people. Your financial situation is your financial situation. It has nothing to do with Chase. Manhattan Bank. It has nothing to do with the governor. It has nothing to do with the president. It has nothing to do with your current boss, your old boss, whatever. Right. Nothing can separate you from his love. And if not, according to Romans 8, and let's just go there, Romans chapter 8, because we can't walk by faith and like accept these truths like in, in like doctrine, but then leave here and complain and act like victims like everybody else. You can't celebrate the victory in here and think like a victim out there. That doesn't work. And don't look at me like, well, she's just young. She doesn't really know what it's like. Thank you, I am young. I am young and I keep getting younger by the day, actually. I just look at myself, I'm like, wow, I just keep getting younger, wow. But like, that's, that's your own pride. Do me, do me a favor and everyone else around you and don't show up next week. Just go ahead and roll back, roll back over. You know what I'm saying? If I don't know, if I don't know, go ahead and go back to sheets. Roll back over. Um, okay. Let's start in verse 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, and again, where his love is, everything else is. Where his love is, his healing is, his power is, his provision is, prosperity, peace, wisdom, everything else that we need. You can't separate his love from everything else that he is. Shall tribulation separate us? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? Peril? Sword? No. Nothing. In all these things, if you skip down to verse 37, we are more than, everyone say more than, more than, more than conquerors. So we, don't, we haven't just overcome, but we've more than overcome. And the reason why is because we didn't have to fight the fight and we got the victory. So what are you actually complaining about? It's a distraction. It's a bad habit. It's a bad habit to talk about pointless things that you cannot control. It's a bad habit to go into a time of, of quiet and consecration and confession and speak the blessing over your life and then show up in the break room and talk about how hard it is. There's no stand in that. There's no stand in that. And so the first stand that we discussed several weeks ago was the stand in your mouth. Stop being double-minded in your mouth. Stop. And, and in many cases, it's just talking about what you feel. And the more you talk about what you feel, the more real those feelings will be to you. And do you want what those feelings produce or the thoughts that those feelings are rooted in? Or do you want the thoughts and feelings and principles of God? So stop talking about what you feel. Stop talking about what you see. Standing on the word of God or standing like you actually have the victory means you take the stand in your mouth and you don't deviate from your confession, no matter what. And so we talked about, um, and you can just write down the reference just for your notes because um, we'll move past these three things. Second Kings chapter four, and we pretty much read the whole chapter, but remember the, the, the um, woman who was barren, um, when she lost her son, she kept her mouth right. She kept saying, it is well, it is well, it is well, it is well, it is well. And so it's not, everybody else's job to keep your, your stand. It's your job. And so stand in your mouth. Number two, we talked about standing in your actions. And we just want to wrap this up with um, a couple of final thoughts, but I need to give you these final three. So the stand in your actions 
involves your understanding of Genesis 8.22, like the law of seed time and harvest. And that doesn't just apply to your finances, but it applies Genesis um, chapter 8, verse 22, standing in your actions, involves you surrendering to the law of seed time and harvest. And don't you know that the enemy would go after this so hard, you know, that, that things aren't the way that they were created, things are the way that you feel. You're not a boy if you're a boy. You're a boy if you feel like a boy, right? The enemy's going after this law. And so you can't, like, if you're sowing seed and you're watering the seed, let me just show you this verse really fast. Proverbs 22, 4. Again, in the Passion Bible. It says, laying your life down in tender surrender before the Lord will bring life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. So if this is what the word says, and if you're doing the word, who cares if you feel poor? Who cares if your checkbook looks like you're poor? That's irrelevant. Why would you, why would you magnify a circumstance over the word and over the activity of your life and then nullify the activity of your life by saying what you see or saying what you feel instead of saying what the word says? For young people, we spend a lot of time because they're the last center, until you're 26 years old, the last center in your brain that fully comes to maturity is the center with which reason meets emotion and stabilizes you. <laughs> until then, it's a, which is fine for me because I like roller coasters. So I'm happy to get on the roller coaster and I see it as a challenge. Like it's fine, but just, it's fine. Like, cause I've seen the faithfulness of God in the incorruptible seed of the word of God, even turn things around when it looks like, oh, we lost them. We lost them. <laughs> even one semester into the wrong decision or a year or two into the wrong decision, you know, like they're, they're not, they're not all there. I'm not being ugly. Everyone that's a teenager is like, she tells us this all the time and I'm not being critical, but I'm just saying like so many adults that don't have a psychological excuse are so infatuated with feelings. Yeah. Well, I just, we talked about it last week. Like, like you respond to a personality, you go after a personality at the expense of principles because you would rather feel good than actually do good in your life and be around other people and the momentum of their good instead of actually having good in your own life. So that shouldn't be us. So as it pertains in your, to the stand in your actions, it's your surrender. And again, write this down. The seed is the response to the victory. Meaning I'm not sowing for something. I'm sowing from something. I'm already rich. And because I'm rich, me and my rich covenant partner have an agreement. And our agreement is my tithe and then anything else that advances his interests before my own. That's the agreement. He gave me eternal life. He gave me all that he has. And the agreement is that in response to our partnership and his love, I honor him with my tithe. And I advance his things first. So if the church needs carpet and I need carpet, the church gets carpet first. If the church has a project and I have a project, the church's project is first. That's the agreement that me and my rich covenant partner have. I'm not poor trying to get something. I'm already rich in him and I have a rich covenant partner. And as long as I seed in response to that partnership, I receive the benefits of that. You can't just sow. You've got to sow from victory, not for victory. I'm not trying to get something. And guys, that doesn't mean that when people receive offerings, not in this house, because Pastor Dean doesn't do it that way. Pastor Greg doesn't do it that way. I don't do it that way. I mean, I don't receive the offering for you guys very frequently, only with the youth. But that doesn't mean that people won't minister to you in such a way that will make you feel like that if you do something, then something. I can't unpack that. I can't unpack that and I'm not their judge. But I can just tell you that even when you hear that, hear it right. Hear it right. 
Their heart is right. They want you to know that you will reap what you sow. But if you get all emotionally involved, you know what I'm saying? Because Pastor Dean's not going to come up here and do a song and dance every single time there are things that we are moving forward in in this church. He's not. He's not going to give you anything for your contribution towards the playground or anything else. He's not going to give you signed copies of his books or a t-shirt. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I like when people sign my books and I obviously like t-shirts. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying you have to be right. You have to be right. You have to hear it right. God is going to honor your seed, but not from this place of like gold star awarded to you today. It's not from that. It's not from that. I have a financial partner who owns everything. And I know nothing compared to him. My little degree, my little business, businesses. I completely defer to him. Starting with the tithe. And then after that, and I don't, I don't necessarily always pray about it, but there's just a knowing in my heart that I want to give as I purpose. Man, God, this is your thing. And in response to our partnership, I seed into that. And then I'm going to go on about my business and I'm going to see your faithfulness accelerate and increase in my life. But if this is, you cannot stand on the word and your performance at the same time. You can't stand on the word and your performance at the same time, which we'll get into that. Number three, you got to stand with faith friends. And I, I didn't say Christian friends. I said faith friends because Christian friends and faith friends are two totally different things. Not every Christian walks by faith. I don't even know how they have faith for salvation because they don't have faith for anything else. So I don't know how that works, but that's not mine to know. I'm just telling you, Galatians 2, 11 through 14, remember when Paul stood up to Peter because Peter was basically being inconsistent. He was preaching salvation by grace, not through works. But then when he was around the Jews, he wasn't eating what the Gentiles were eating because he was trying to save face. And Paul called him out. Like, who are you to compromise the truth that way? You're being, too, you're being double-minded. You're saying one thing, but then behind closed doors or with this group of people, you're honoring the law that you just preached deliverance from. You can't do that. And then on another occasion in Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 40, and I'll read these verses, but look at these accounts. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, come, let's go back again and visit and help minister the brethren in every town where we made known the message of the Lord and see how they're getting along. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. There's always going to be people, especially in your leadership that don't lead after the spirit, but that lead out of their soul. You can't lead out of your soul. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit, which means you can't be carnal and you can't be distracted when you're serving here. Okay. So we don't have phone buckets, but like, don't tempt me. You know what I mean? Can only stand up here and miss light cues and miss video cues so many times. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's one thing if you're paying contractors who don't honor God, don't even care about the things of God. And you know what's unfortunate is some churches would rather hire people that they can pay because at least they'll work for a wage and do their job right. Paul did not think it best to have along with them the one who had quit. Some people don't let people go. And Paul's like, no, he's not in a place to travel with me. This is a serious thing. He's not in a place to travel with me. Paul's like, no, John Mark's not coming. Um, He hadn't gone on with us. He deserted us in Pamphylia, which sounds like a disease, Pamphylia. (laughs) He deserted us there. And so there was a sharp disagreement between Barnabas and Paul so that they separated from each other and Barnabas went ahead and took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. Now, this wasn't 
the end of John Mark's story. He was restored later on, but you can't keep holding on to people that have let go. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus didn't water down the rich young ruler's opportunity because he knew if he walked away, it was gonna end badly. He didn't do that. Because your greatest gift is your ability to decide. It's an open book test. God already told you what to choose. And if people don't choose it, you think you can save them. You think you can rescue them. And they've already decided in their heart, now you're just making this look cheap. And it's not cheap. It's not cheap. It does require total surrender, but just like Pastor Dean said last week, like you give up nothing and get everything, or you give up everything and get whatever it is. You guys get it. Rewatch the message. I can't do all your studying for you. And here's the thing. If you hang with rebels, you will always be offended. You keep listening to their complaints. What for? What for? Now you're gonna be offended. And now you're gonna start to see things from their point of view. When sheep follow sheep, they both fall off a cliff. Sheep aren't aren't designed to be led by each other, they're designed to be led by a shepherd. Which means when you allow anybody to, to intercept your relationship with the shepherd, because you think that you're doing a favor and being like the liaison, wow. I would like to personally announce to please never be a liaison between me, Pastor Faith, Pastor Dean, Pastor Kathy. We don't have any space on our, in our life for liaisons. Let those people come and say that to my face and stop trying to explain to them what I meant. If they want to know, they have my number. And if they don't have my number, then give it to them. And that goes for everybody here including our staff. We have no, there's no A-team leader of liaisons. We don't do liaisons. We don't do liaisons here. If you didn't get what I said, come and ask me myself. But I don't need your help. And if anything, you're not helping, you're muddying the waters. And you're not hurting me. Because I'm gonna be here. One thing I do know, I'm gonna be here. Greg's gonna be here. Pastor Faith, Pastor Kathy, Pastor, we're gonna be here. You're vulnerable. And they're obviously completely on the fence or they've already jumped over. So what are you doing? What are you doing? That's not a leader. That's an idiot. That's an idiot. You don't like the, do you think all the, you think all the people that no longer follow the, the message of faith, you think we're on the phone with them trying to convince them? You think all the people that have criticized Brother Hagen or criticized Dr. Rodney or criticized anybody that we're trying to be a liaison? Nope. No, we're done. We're not mad, but we have no fellowship. We have no fellowship. You cannot be spiritual and be carnal. You have to decide which it's gonna be. Are you gonna be spiritual? Because the, the, you think these are such a big deal. These things are such a big deal. Well, it's just so sad. It's not sad. I'm not sad. Right. Why are you sad? Is your life sad? So you're gonna be sad because their life's sad? Why well, just hate to see it? Why do you hate that? Why don't you hate your dirty laundry? Why don't you hate the kid in your own house who's on the fence? Why don't you hate that? Why don't you hate the things that you can actually control? Like a dirty garage. Hate stuff that you can actually fix. Yeah. Instead of hating stuff that people make stupid decisions every day. Yeah. Every day. You can't do anything about it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray the Ephesians prayers. Everyone wants to scramble at the last minute. Three months ago, you were bad mouthing with them. And now, because they went all the way with that trash talk and you were just having a bad day, now you feel bad. Because you're carnal. And we're not going to come in here and shout the victory when you act and live either like a victim or you're so carnal out of love and expect to win. You cannot win that way. You cannot win in strife. 
You cannot go to bed with anything on anybody ever on yourself, on anyone else. There has to be a firm, no strife, no offense. And sometimes you can be so backed up, you don't even see it. And so you pray, Father, show me if there is anything in my life that I'm holding on to. Anything, show me any offense. Get it out of me so that, show me what it is so I can get it out. I mean, he's not going to get it out of you, but he can reveal it to you so that you can deal with it. And I'm going to let it go. And I'm not going to be offended with myself. I'm not going to be offended with others because that little stuff packs up just like hardness of heart, just like a li- what are those things called? Hemorrhoids or what are they? Gallstones. Gallstones. Anything that causes an obstruct- obstruction of any flow. Kidney stones, gallstones, all the stones, y'all, all the stones. The father said, if they will stand on my word, I will hold them up. He is the chief cornerstone. Matthew twenty two forty one through 45. This is the, the, the chief stone that the builders have rejected. Well, you don't be hating on the Pharisees and the Sadducees like people in the church still aren't rejecting him today. If you will stand on Jesus, so to speak, which is his word, John 1, 14, if they will stand on my word, meaning if they will stand on Jesus, I will hold them up. Which means if you will, I tried to share this with my family yesterday, just some things that the Lord was showing me and they've like really blessed me. And it was just like a thing, you know, like they didn't care, number one, which is fine. Um, and number two, however I said it, like made them laugh. And so if they're laughing right now, just enjoy their joy because I enjoy their joy. Um, so what I was saying was, if you are standing on him, you take everything, like you take that financial thing and you put it on him, he'll hold you up. But you have to put it there. You have to put it on the word or in essence, put the word on it. And your other options that you have to avoid like the plague, number one is tradition which Jesus said in Mark seven thirteen, like these people have basically nullified the word for their own tradition. So don't do that. Don't think that, that your little way of doing things is going to hold you up because it won't. Number two, performance. Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Hebrews 4, 10 in the mirror Bible says God's rest celebrates his finished work. Whoever enters into God's rest immediately abandons his own efforts to complement what God has already perfected. There's no reason for that. You're not going to experience anything that the father has made available to you any other way outside of faith in the word, not in your own performance. God's rest celebrates, this is Hebrews 4.10 in the mirror. God's rest celebrates his finished work. Whoever enters into God's rest immediately abandons his own efforts to complement what God has already perfected. The language of the law is due. The language of grace is done. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. No, Lord, because of all you have done for me, I respond in obedience. I, ref- I respond in humility. I respond with my seed or whatever the situation demands. Hebrews 6, 1, also in the mirror. Consequently, as difficult as it may seem, you ought to divorce yourself from sentimental attachment to the prefiguring doctrine of the message, which was anything that had to do with what I did in order to get his attention. Yeah. You, have to, you have to divorce yourself from that thinking. It's all religion. And if you try to stand on religion, it will not hold you up. Religion will not hold you up. You will not manifest healing in religion. You will not manifest prosperity in religion. You will not manifest peace or rest or joy or anything in religion. If they will stand on my word, I will hold them up. Lastly, number three, other people's opinions. You can't You can't stand on that. I like what um, Jesus, we learn from Jesus. This is John 2, 23 through 24 in the Passion. And we'll close here. John 2, 23 
through 24. While Jesus was at the Passover feast, the number of his followers began to grow and many gave their allegiance to him because of all the miraculous signs they had seen him doing. But Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew how fickle human hearts can be. He didn't need to tell anyone to tell him about human nature for he fully understood what man was capable of doing. So you have to evaluate, okay, what am I really standing on? Because if I'm standing on the rock, if I'm standing on the word, if I'm standing on him, then why are things falling apart? Why am I falling? Because the victory is sure it is finished. Am I more concerned about what people are saying or what people think? Am I, is the focus of my Christianity what I do or is it what he has done? Or am I content to just go to a church and be like religious with this? And, and guys, how do you know? Well, if Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. There's a, there's a flow of joy and peace in the life of a believer who's actually a believer. And then there's like this rigid, like crunchy, judgmental flow for everybody else. And it's your job to defend that flow every single day because he sits in the heavens and laughs. In the anointing is joy and with joy comes the anointing. So if you're going to be a cranky pants, you're not going to have a sincere flow from him. He'll just let you have your space in your bad day, your bad month, your bad year. You know what I mean? But in joy, there's always like a note of victory and an understanding that as a leader, I'm anointed for problems. I'm anointed for problems. Now I can't solve other people's problems. My anointing doesn't supersede their responsibility. But if, if a problem comes to me, it's going to be taken care of. If I come into agreement with somebody to an earth agree is touching anything. If I put my faith on it, it's going to happen because he hears my prayers and I'm not special. He's no respecter of persons, but I I know that he's the heavyweight champion here. I'm just his partner. I'm just his partner. I'm not the deal. I'm just the partner. He has more stock in this than I do. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm just leaning on him. And in that standing on him, you don't fall. Do y'all remember that old DC talk song? What if I stumble? What if I fall? lose my step and I make fools of us all there's so much Christian music that's not Christian and I like them I'm not mad I'm not judging anybody but I'm just saying if it's Christian it has to be scriptural so we grew up here in that what if we fall I ain't fallen and it's pretty obvious if you fall other people you're going to take people down with you That is true. So just don't fall, but just build your life on the rock of the word. Amen.